I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Zach went off to do movie business, Jay, so he won't be with us for this podcast. He's working hard. Theblindmovie.com. I promised him I would mention the movie uh, for you guys to check that out. See what we're offering there to get little teasers and different things about the movie. But the trailer just released recently, so uh, those guys are working hard. It's going to be out this September, so uh, be sure and be looking for that. Jay's finally saw it. Um, I did see it. I wasn't sure why he sent it to me. I didn't know if he wanted me. I think he want, he knows you would give him a a critical look, like yeah. give him the good and the bad and what they need to work on because you have a sense to do that. I'm not a good critiquer because – I just, I don't know. It's just not not my try gift. To, yeah, you try to be positive. I try to What's, be too positive. I was Because sometimes you, not that I'm not saying you're negative. I'm saying you have a way to say, yeah, but you need to work on You need to be critiqued. That's a good thing. It's just some people are yeah. better at it than others. Well, and I mean, I'm on TV. And, uh, yeah. you know, so our show, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty well just off the cuff. You know, we pick a location and we go there and try to make it work. But. So they'll send me after they put it together, you know, the editors and all. There's a lot that's filmed. Well, they try to, you know, find the story in this, the point. You know, they say when you tell a story, you have a beginning, a, a middle, and the end, which is why I love that reference when I hear someone from Hollywood say that because I always think about Hebrews thirteen eight, where it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm like, He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's the ultimate story. He's eternal. But so, but I'll watch these things because you don't. You think, well, you you experienced it. You know what happened. Oh no, because they're taking a few days of footage and putting it into a you know thirty to forty minute, like a highlight reel, I guess. And they're yeah. trying to link. Because when people watch something, they're like, "Well, what? What's what's the? It's not just ran, it's not a documentary, and it's not a random collection of just meaningless things." Right. So it's amazing that you'll you'll watch a rough cut and say, "Oh, that was well, that was better than I thought," and I was there. I mean, it it was like this was. Then you watch one and you're like, "What happened? <laughs> what?" <laughs> What <laughs> what is this? So, a couple times I've like I'm like find go back and find some other footage. This right. this this <laughs> crickets. But uh, so I guess you know he knows I'm used to that. So I I laid out the positives, which all the positives were the major things. It was a powerful story. I think they I lived it. But it it seemed like I relived a lot of those things when yeah. I was a kid, and it brought back memories I really didn't want to bring back. But you know, I think it was therapy in a way. But I also, you know, noticed from on the production side, I'm like, well, I couldn't hear a couple things, or uh, you know, yeah. of course, all those things. He's like, oh, we're correcting all them, yeah. you know, which they are. They're in the process of doing that. Yeah, because that's why it takes <clears throat> you know almost a year to do post production. But you know, it's interesting, even even. We were working on the first on the the little duck show, you know. You'd you'd be a part of a scene and, and part of an episode, and I can remember many times we were like, I don't know, that that didn't seem to work at all. Yeah. And then they would put it together and cut it and add in all their visuals they do, and because they put a lot of money into production of the first show, and you watch it and thought, eh. Well, yeah, it, it, the the end result was way better than it felt like when you were actually doing it in real time. I and think so, this is where they invented the phrase "based on a true story" because yeah. they, you know, they'll interview you and they're asking you questions. Well, they they'll do an interview, you know, a week or two later. Right. Well, I can't even remember what happened. That's right. So I'm kind of thinking back, trying to give some kind of narrative doing of what stuff was going on, that. and they'll take it out of context and put it. Well, then when they do that, it then then it became funny, and you're like. You know, how do you come up with this? I'm like, well, I really didn't. They just <laughs> took it out of context and put it in that light. Well, it became funny. I'm like, don't blame me, blame them. But they're like, well, it's funny, so it's okay. Right. So, I mean, look, that's just the sausage being made of, of movie yeah. production and, uh, and TV show making. But I've always said, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not an actor. 
and we've always just kind of decided to be who we are, right, wrong, or indifferent. And in this case, with Phil's movie, well, you know, it, it shows how you used to be. I mean, it, most people wouldn't have the vulnerability or courage to, to put that out there because, you know, it was mostly negative. But that's what we do in Christ. Right. I mean, this is the reason we're here. We, we, God takes us, and he, you know, he creates us, he gives us this free will, and out of that free will comes, you know, a, a lot of good things, but a lot of destructive behavior, and uh, which makes our decision to surrender to him that much more powerful. Yeah. It makes me feel a little better to watch a few years of sinful behavior when I read what the Apostle Paul said about his behavior. Yeah. I really? mean... I'm like, if God could spare him through all of what he's doing there, yeah. I mean, he's killing people, piles of people. Yeah. And stoning them death, stoning people to death is a pretty rough way to go. Yeah, Even, well, it's hard to one, change. One of his, you know? one of, one of the, who was the guy he, he held the clothes for and the first stoning, Philip? Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. yeah. Acts 7. Well, I think the current the uh, prison, brutal. the current brutal. prison system, shows you how hard it is to rehabilitate people. Yep. Yeah. You know, I mean, we we lock people up for different reasons. I mean, one to keep everyone else safe, but you know, they call it a rehabilitation program yep. <laughs> of sorts. But unfortunately, most people who go to prison, when they get out, they do something to get right back in. Yeah. And so. You know, we're going to see that reference in, you know, Jesus goes of all to all places, his hometown. You would think he would be welcome there. I but could see that no matter what ever happened after we visited Angola, where lifers, a lot of people in there for the rest of their life. Then when, as you are leaving, where the river bottom hits the high ground, there's a little slope there. There's a graveyard out there. Yep. Uh, Remember? Yep. With a lot of a lot of sticks of wood, yeah, driven down on them. I mean, it's a it's a sad sad visit. Yeah. And to, to his point, it's hard to get him to rehabilitate him. Well, and you, they when, came there, and fifty, sixty years later, they ended up right there on the edge of the. You and I talked about it. When we were there looking at that. That man. That's there's a reminder that that's where you end this up. This is where you end up. Well, I think that's a perfect lead in to after Jesus was tempted, he returned in verse 14 of Luke 4 to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So, which is the fourth time this is mentioned in... Yeah, first three chapters. Well, yeah, he, he the Spirit descends on him at his baptism. He goes from the water in the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the evil one. He's led by the Spirit. He's in the Spirit. He quotes Scripture and refuses the snares of the evil one. And now, still by the power of the Spirit, he, and the news about him is spreading throughout the whole country in verse 14, and he begins teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Yeah. Which is another temptation, by the way. Everyone seems happy at this point. Everybody's happy. <laughs> so he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And I did some research on this, you know, and they would have these, you know, they'd start off with some in the synagogue kind of worship. They would have some prayer and praise, kind of like a worship thing that we do. And there were there were several instances, uh, five or six, or maybe seven seven things that happened, which he only participated in two of them, which I think is is something. And so everybody would be standing up, and this guy, someone would read something from the prophets. I, I think they would read something from the law, then they read something from the prophets, and then he would go sit down, and then everybody else would remain standing, and then he would pontificate on the meaning right. of the the red prophecy. This is what they did, you know, in Israel, in synagogues two thousand years ago. So he stood up to read in verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Which now, you, to your point, well, we four references, and he comes to this text. We've well, seen he the finds four. one that says <laughs> exactly. the Spirit of the Lord is on me after it just said the Spirit of the Lord is leading him, is on him, it's coming upon him, right. he's in it, he's full of it, yeah. he's full of the Spirit. Yep. Yeah. I think that's four one. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. And it's Spirit. written down a long time ago. So he picked a unique, not unique, he picked an interesting place because in Isaiah, there's a whole section uh, either named the, the suffering servant or the servant of the Lord. And and it's always looked at as kind of mysterious to uh, people from Israel because it was the picture of the Messiah that was to come. And that, you know, you have Isaiah 51 and 52, that, you know, that in 53 that shows that whoever this Messiah is, he, he was not a not a good looking guy, but he was going to redeem his root out of dry ground. Yeah. yeah. He was going to suffer. He would be pierced. He would, I mean, it, it was a, it was a difficult passage when you think about it, because you're talking about someone to lead you out, but it also looked like somebody he, has been brutalized. He's going to go through a hard time <laughs> to do it. Even yeah. if you go back and read Isaiah, I think it's seven, fourteen, and fifteen, you have that famous prophecy that he would be from uh, the seed line of David, and and he would be uh, of a virgin. Yeah, came from a virgin. Would be called Emmanuel. All these things were came true. So here he is picking, this is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, verse 18. Now these people he's talking to, I'm Are, just guessing here, somebody had to have read that. Oh, they knew it like They're the back of their head. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, they knew this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Well, yeah, they're at a worship service. For you know, and they they're reading the Bible, and the old heads have been coming here for years. Oh yeah, and, reading and these texts. You got to remember something. And everybody's happy. <laughs> that's really key to understanding what's fixing to happen. Because when we think, oh, we go back to our hometown, you know, what would be, what would happen? Or, but you got to remember, his hometown was being controlled by the Roman Empire. These people are under the thumbnail of oppression. They're they're not happy. They're yeah. they're having to pay taxes. They don't. These people have invaded their hometown, and I don't think anybody would be. They happy. were in a state of persecution. Yeah, nobody would be happy with that arrangement. That's this is how wars get fought. When some other country invades your country and takes over, people rise up because they're not happy about this. So they're waiting on this said Messiah, because and you'll see from this passage that he chose, this is good news to them because they don't like the being occupied and being being oppressed. So he read you look throughout their history and it wasn't like it is now. I mean there were different times where their other kingdoms came in, but this this was a unique situation because they were still holding on to their Judaism fully and yet they were controlled by the Roman Empire. They're being oppressed. They're not free people. No, this so is watch all what the way he reads. That. This would hang on Jess, let's take a break. So one of the things that uh, recently I've been looking into uh, getting some uh, increased life insurance, that's not something you think about a lot when you're younger, although it's, I think it's important that you should because uh, that's probably when it's needed the most. You have a young family. If something were to happen to you, uh, you want to be able to take care of them best you can. And This podcast is about, of course, eternal life insurance, but life insurance even on this earth is important as well. And so that's one of the reasons I've been looking into it. Uh, one of the uh, sponsors of our podcast that is great to be able to help with that is a company called Policy Genius. And so basically, they've been built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to get your lowest price. So what they do is they do the hard work for you to find the cheapest rates uh, on uh, life insurance. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams, which we like that. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. So we like that. They are no added fees and your personal details are private. 
So they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. These guys are great. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Go to policygenius.com slash Phil. Click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius, all one, dot com slash Phil. Policygenius.com slash Phil. This will be good news to them. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Now, he's reading Isaiah. He's, you know, we, we know what he's saying, but they are not quite sure because he's just a, he's in his hometown. He's a carpenter. And they know full of scandal and accusation and kind of a weird guy, let's face it. And he's very young. Well, he's 30, 30 years 30 old. 30 years old. It's in their culture was young to be in a role where you're going to be like teaching people and all that. So, yeah. So the Spirit of the Lord is on him because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Well, these people are poor because of the Roman uh, invasion here. I mean, they're not as rich as they think they right. could be or whatever. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the for the prisoners, which I feel like. In a physical way, they would deem themselves as prisoners under, even though they're not locked up, you know. But they're not making that analogy. They're the just, Romans. They're, the Romans stayed with them, but 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 the Romans didn't like them. Yeah, right. So they didn't, and, they didn't like this bunch. No. And recovery of sight for the blind, which is probably, you know, something that they were probably having a hard time wrapping their head around. What what? Somehow or another, this Messiah going to heal us and different things and, and help the blind. You make an interesting point because there's a higher and lower thought here, Jace. They're probably relating to macro political issues, but each one of these, of course, is a personal. <laughs> it's all speaking to their personal blindness, their personal. Oh, right. Yeah. It, it's a spirit. He's making. He's making a, a spiritual, spiritual point. They're having a, point. but they're having a physical application. Yeah, that's a good. So point. to release the oppressed, and I'm sure that's probably the main thing they heard. Yep. Because if I was being occupied, and there was a prophecy that someone was going to come and make all this right, this would be something I would want to hear. Now, then it says an interesting phrase to proclaim the year. Of the Lord's favor, so which is a quote, and most people, I don't know how you feel about this, Al, but it's it's a year of jubilee reference in in Leviticus twenty five that the, or twenty four or twenty five, and I read it, so it's like every fifty kind years, of a little time frame when this is going to happen. Well, it was every fifty years, there was like a clean slate. It yeah. it it's. You, your debts were canceled. Now, it was ever 50 years, which is a lot of time. But it's like <laughs> it was everybody only gonna got a new twice, start. Yeah. yeah, like if you're in prison, you get out of jail. You uh, you know, you don't owe anybody any debt. Uh, they call it the Day of Atonement. You everything, you just got to start over under this old law system. Reset, yeah. So I looked it up. If you want to get deep into that, you can, but I'm pretty sure... Of course, even my reference here on the uh, in the margin of my Bible says Jubilee. Yeah. You know, for that nineteen, you can look that up. Which uh, Isaiah is referencing that. So then he rolled up the scroll. So he reads this passage, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. So everybody else is still standing there. Well, now it's time for him to tell you what that means, and. And, actually, and, and, and when it's going to happen? Well, well, you know, he can say anything you want to. The the they this is how this worked. He he was going to give a ser- an explanation of the prophecy. Well, his sermon was three, four, five, six, eight words, which is probably the his first sermon was the shortest sermon in the history of that gathering. I could use a few eight word sermons. I like that. But Jay, you know, it's interesting. Jesus has a dramatic, he understands uh, public speaking too, because he waits, like he sits down and says, everybody's eyes are fascinated. So I imagine this like dramatic pause because they're waiting for him to tell him and he's just looking for, for, he gives them a oh, beat. I agree a hundred percent. He's waiting to see it like, okay, is he going to, is he going to explain this? What is, what and is there's it? also, you know, a message in here about public speaking. I mean, sometimes it's not, 
how much you say. Yeah. I mean, he says one sentence. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Boom. Then he dropped the mic. <laughs> now, when you, if you're just reading your weekly Bible study and you read through Luke 4, uh, my daughter and I was talking about this last night. You, you're not even, this is not even registering. You're like, what What do you say? Because it, 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 it's not in our language, I get, you know. But but if you just stop right now. Think about all the things they had heard up to this. They hadn't heard this. No I mean, one had it, ever said that before. No. <laughs> this, I mean, it was, I guarantee you there was a murmur. It's like, what do you say? What do you say? Today, today. This scripture is fulfilled. Well, so then you have to go back. I'm sure there was some rustling back to the. <laughs> so let me read this again. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Is he talking about him? Because he has anointed me. Is he claiming to be anointed from the Lord? And he's going to preach good news to the poor and free the prisoners and. Recovery of sight for the blind. I'm still not sure what that means, but to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Is he's going to institute the a, jubilee. The jubilee. Oh, we fix to do a clean slate, and he's the one doing it. So that's why the response is what it is, because they, well, they all spoke well of him, because they thought, well, I like this. If you have a way to pull this off, we fix to be free. We got, he's going to fix my cataracts. I'm going to be, uh, we're going to lift this oppression. He's going to make me rich somehow. And so at, they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And then there was a, wait a minute, that, there, was a, there was a Q&A that just miraculously evolved. Because he said the sermon, usually, you know, I've, Al, you've done this. We get up and speak, and then you do a Q&A, yeah. but it's planned. This right. Q&A happens spontaneously. They're to the point now where they're saying, is this guy, well, well, somebody is, said, is this guy saying? Well, isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. So and you, so can you know what the they were other. asking? It was the shack line you saw that, uh, who, who? <laughs> well, and you read the other version, <laughs> uh, the other uh, Gospels, and and they're like, what well, he isn't he a carpenter? I mean, yeah, he's in his hometown. They're like, All right, this is great, but they start doubting because they're like, but we know you. I mean, and you got to remember when you're in your own hometown, they've seen this guy. They seen him as a kid. They he was going around. They're like, you're gonna fulfill all this today, because he basically said. I mean, with all due respect to the chosen, they got it right because they they gave a version of this on one of the episodes that he was like, "I am the law," <laughs> but in this case, he was like, "I am this." Yeah, I am the fulfillment. This is this is me, and you're so, right. This thing about it, some of them in their minds, they're flooding back. They're watching him and Joseph, and maybe some of his brothers delivering some something they've made somewhere. And you just get to thinking like, well, that, he's who, he's just a guy up the street. He can't be this. Exactly. But now notice they're happy at this point. That's right. This, they're not. So it, I'm going to skip down because I, and you think, well, why are you taking so much pain to go through this exactly? Because I, I think it's real hard to wrap your head around what's happening here if you don't really put yourself in this situation and see where this all goes wrong. So if you skip down to verse 28, now I'm skipping over his answer to the question, well, yeah. isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Joseph's son? It can't be. He can't be this. But you skip down to verse 28. So whatever Jesus said that we're fixing to read, all the people, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built. Now, this is his hometown. In order to throw him off the cliff, <laughs> which I think is a very interesting phrase, because in, in the same chapter, just a couple of days ago, the devil was tempting him, him to go throw himself off the cliff and let the angels 
rescue him. Yeah. And now, just just a few few days later, we have people. He's on the edge of the cliff, taking him <laughs> to a cliff to throw him down. Right. You so, talk about a sermon that went sideways. Well, an an- it wasn't even a sermon; it was just an answer. <laughs> they asked a question: "Aren't you, aren't aren't you a carpenter? Aren't you uh, what do they say? Isn't this Joseph's son?" Which is an interesting question. Yeah, right. I've, Jason, I've had a few sermons that went south, but nobody ever drove me over to the to the mill. This and took went me from to the, altar call <laughs> to cliff throwing, cliff diving. That's right. That's right. Without your hang glider. So Maddie, who's our uh, new producer, uh, is getting married soon. And so we're super excited for her. We've been trying to give her some marital advice. And so, Maddie, I got some new advice for you. Some of our good friends that focus on the family are starting a podcast. And it's a great thing for anyone to check out, but especially if you're entering holy matrimony. It's, it can't hurt to get a lot of good information. Is that right, Dad? I mean, most of us learn what we learn from kind of the school of hard knocks. Yep. But I always say your own experiences are not necessarily your best teacher, but someone else's experiences you know, are a little less painful. Uh, Focus has been around a long time, 40 plus years as a ministry. Uh, we partner with them on several different things. So uh, everything they put out is outstanding. Uh, their new podcast is called Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. Kind of like the Queen song, Dad. Yeah, it is. It can get crazy. It can. Now, we're not crazy. You don't call your wife crazy or your husband, but the marriage itself can be a little bit crazy. She, she calls me crazy all the time. <laughs> and y'all been married a long time. Y'all are scaring the little blondie back there. <laughs> no, no, she's with us. Maddie's I, with I us. I take it as a compliment. It is. Yeah. A little fear along in your marriage. That doesn't hurt anybody. That's right. So this is a podcast for married couples. It could be in the middle of a, a messy moment. Uh, you could be uh, having a great marriage and you just want it to be a little bit better. Uh, Greg and Aaron Smalley are the ones that do it. Uh, they're fantastic. I've met them both and had many conversations with them. Each episode hits on uh, relevant things like communication, intimacy, money, uh, daily stress. So check them out. New episodes of Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage drop every Monday. You can find it on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. Download it now. So the reason I did that this way is you're like, what could he have said? Because everything was going great. <laughs> and he spoke the truth. Yeah. He is the fulfillment. We we know yeah. who he is. Shouldn't the people in his hometown have figured this out by now? That maybe this wasn't a scandal. That he came from a virgin, you know, in quotation marks. And what if this is really true? He's making this claim. So what was Jesus's answer to? Isn't this Joseph's son? What what? Where did this go from being amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips? I mean, it almost Luke is saying this in a way that he's trying to get you to see. They're just bubbly over being having the good news and proclaiming freedom and recovery of sight and freedom and it's all depressed. stuff we hear every yeah, sunday morning that's right you know people get up and say hey let's we're gonna tear some walls down oh, you know we're gonna break those, some chains those of you that were blind you'll see now we're gonna you know who wants their miracle today people are gonna see it, it's the same kind of sermon they they got you know you know where it came from mm. So what was the answer that caused this cliff episode? So you go back to verse 23. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. So you're like, what? (laughs) So... Which is really interesting to to get that answer to that question, because that would be a, they would have said what? (laughs) So I don't think they had so much a problem with that statement, because he's basically saying, you're going to say, because once you wrap your head around that I can heal the blind, uh, give release, free the oppressed, uh, proclaim freedom for the prisoners and preach good news to the poor. Well, he also gives you a little clue there, Jace, that he had been doing some things that he assumes they would know about. Right. If it, you read like the first three chapters of John, yeah. you, you get all the things 
you know, he was doing. He had the conversation uh, and uh, the the woman at the well in well, John four. That's right. I remember Cana, Cana, which is so just, the word had already spread. Well, it should have. Certain. It should have. Well, but, we read in verse uh, fourteen, Jesus returned to the Gal- Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole country. So he's so, so they had heard. So when you go to John two, you're right. As you read about it, remember when we remember when Mary came to him and said they're out of wine. That was in Cana, which they is, had heard rumors, but they had not this particular one have not heard him yet. Right, and he well, t- they had, had rumors that were true. To Al's point, they had heard about this something happening at this wedding. Yeah, I mean, look, you six huge jars the size of this room, one hundred and eighty gallons, uh, and you're uh, somehow <laughs> another they got turned to wine from water. Well, and, that that that's gonna. Get and people out. are still talking about how great the wine was. This wasn't the cheap stuff. So that happened in Cana. But you remember what Jesus said, "Why, woman, why do you trouble me? You know my time hasn't come." So in other words, he's he's telling her it's not quite time to start. But because you asked me, and so they're hearing these things that he's done, which is part of his point here. The four J's gets to the reading the rest of it because they've heard some things about it, but he has apparently he hasn't done anything like that in Nazareth. This is kind of his, his well, right. opening. Sound. So he said, "I tell you the truth." He he continued, which I think is a big lie. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. So now we're like th- this is the first moment that it becomes uncomfortable because he's now making an accusation to them that evidently you you know you probably want me to do some of this stuff you've been hearing here but no prophet is accepted in his home you're 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 not accepting me for who I am so, i mean i'm sure people are rolling their eyes like what are you talking about well, you're you're kind of being a little outlandish here jesus the carpenter so then he says because I, before you leave that the reason he's, and another reason he said that is because a prophet prophesies what the Almighty tells him. And you look back over the course, he, he's going to mention two here, but you look back at Jeremiah and some others, not very well liked, not very well accepted, no. because the messages were so direct and pointed to the people, it wasn't popular. So that's part of the, what he says behind the no prophet is, you know. Well, and without. true. And I think there's an insinuation here that he's claiming to be a prophet who's telling the truth. And he's claiming that another prophet that they all respect, even though he's dead, is Isaiah. Yeah. And he's saying, yeah, Isaiah was talking about me. (laughs) Well, you know, (laughs) I'm not making fun of these people because I would probably be a little skeptical of that statement. I was like, no, I mean, I know you. What I mean is the fact he's in his hometown, he's not going to get away from this because they're going to say, you're claiming that Isaiah had you in mind with this? But Jesus is saying, yeah, because the rumors that you've been hearing about me, they're all true. The rumors that my mom was a virgin, true. (laughs) You know? And you remember, so when he would go places, remember, he'd say, don't tell anybody. We're not quite ready to reveal. You know, like he would go all over once he got into Judea and all the way down to Jerusalem. But he went to his hometown, and he just went in and told him right off the bat, this is who I am. I think it was to give him a shot to do the right thing, but obviously Yeah, I think he probably knew this wasn't going to go well. Maybe. But he, what he does something it is something really controversial because this message that he read from Isaiah was all flowers and rainbows when they were the recipients of the freedom. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you my what I think before I read this because it's a little hard to follow what exactly he's saying. What he's fixing to say is that you're not these people because you don't believe me. Well, that's what got him riled up yeah, because he, he then does this. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. So you got to remember, these people know the Bible. That's uh, First Kings 15 and following. Yeah. That's where you read yeah, that. I think it was 17. Yeah. Right? Well, maybe it starts it's, at 15. Started at 15. Yeah. And I read this, and it it's a fascinating a story. It's a great story. But it says, Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in 
Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So let me just give you, because you say, well, who is this widow? Well, she was not a Jew. That's right. She was a Gentile, and she was a sinful woman. So they're like, do what? There was a famine. He's telling a story here, and he said there was a famine, and Elijah was not sent to any of Israel's people. And it was like it happened <clears throat> yesterday. I mean, he... Well, and I think maybe we should just read it out. You want, I, think, I think we could read the First Kings yeah, 17. 17 section, and you get... Because it's such a great story to see his point. And I'm not sure how many people just have First Kings 17 on the <laughs> <laughs> on their speed dial. Yeah, which I think is really cool that the drought was so bad that Elijah was being fed by ravens in a creek. And, you know, and just to set section. the context, let's take another break. I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, most of the medications that we take in our country are not made here. Did you know that, Dad? No, I didn't have any idea. And most are made in China, uh, which can create some problems because, one, China is a long way from here, and we don't always have the best relationship uh, with China, especially lately. And so uh, it's a bit of a problem, uh, a supply chain shortage. There's a lot of issues. And so we got some new friends at Jace Medical, not connected to our Jace, but <laughs> it is Jace Medical. Um, and, uh, so these guys have what they call a Jace case, which is five life-saving antibiotics and you have them for emergency use, which is a great concept and idea. Cause it's very hard to get this sort of thing, obviously without having to go to the doctor and go through the whole process. And so these guys are doctors, uh, that came up with this idea and they do it all online. And so you, you fill out a simple online form. In some cases, you may have to jump on a quick call with one of their board-certified doctors, uh, and they handle everything else. They do the online evaluation. Uh, they have the licensed pharmacy medication delivery. There's ongoing consultation uh, if you need it. Uh, there, and I met the guy that started. He's just a small-town doctor who had a great idea, especially if you're rural um, like I said, you're trying to prepare in case something goes wrong. So they have doctors online that you consult with and, and that they're going to talk to you. So they're going to make sure everything is, is uh, keeping you safe, uh, and helping you out. Jace case is what they're called. So prepare for everything with the Jace case, go to jacemedical.com, enter the code unashamed at checkout for a discount on your order. So the promo code unashamed at J A S E medical.com. The, there was a wicked king and queen, Jezebel and Jezebel and Ahab. Yep. Okay. And so they and so this the reason there was a famine is God was trying to get their attention, and so that's the setting for what happens here. So you know, it, times got tough here. There was a famine. I'm sure they were all familiar with that. In Three and a half history. years, no rain. And so he's eating. You know, ravens or you know, the Lord's taking care of him. But in verse seven. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went there. He came to the town. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. <laughs> and which, by the way, the reason I'm reading this is in the same chapter talking about the temptation of Jesus, you also had a temptation over being hungry and a piece of bread. I mean, you're, you're seeing some similarities in what he's uh, pointing out here no in, in that. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. So she's saying, I'm about to make our last meal. This is it. We're out of food. <laughs> we're out of food. We, we're out of everything. It's over. This is our last meal. It's going to be special, and then we're going to die. Elijah, Elijah said to her, this is verse 13 of chapter 17, 1 Kings, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. 
Now look, any human being on the planet, if you're at your desk door and it's all over starvation, you're thinking this is the biggest hustle con and, and this is the old, hey, the Lord told me <laughs> this is you to give me some bread. Because what she should have said or what I'd have said is, well, he didn't tell me. <laughs> this but, is like the email email from Nigeria that says, you know, you got $10 million here. If you'll just send me a 1000 I'll tell you how you can get it. But, know, but actually, I read in verse 9 that God had told her to do it. So yeah. now it's happening. Right. So verse 14, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up in the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the lamb. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. And look, then the story even gets greater than that because sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. So she said to Elijah, well, what, what, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? That's why I said she's a sinful woman. And thought, well, they've, they've done a little diagnostic on my heart yeah. and realized that I'm terrible. She's basically saying, why deliver me from my last meal if you're just going to kill my son anyway? It was her point. So Elijah said, give me your son. He took him. From her arms, carried him up to the upper room where he was staying, laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, rescue this boy and let the boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said, Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. Which is a a real profound statement because that's how this crowd should have responded to Jesus' word. That's why he said, I'm telling you the truth. So And... He's making a subtle reference, Jace, that he doesn't mention in his version of the resurrection. Calls for a little patience. Well. A little patience. Exactly. That part. That's I why mean, I wanted to read it. Yes, the sir. ramifications of this and the shadow of this are obvious. Yep. That Jesus is the Son of God. He has the power to redeem. He has the power to raise the dead. Yep. That he is the fulfillment. This is the guy. And, and here's what here's why this just went off the rails. What Judaism has been doing up to now is you get up and you talk about God and how awesome he is, which is great. And then you talk about how you can follow the commands to somehow please him. Jesus is basically saying, believe in me and follow me. I mean, he he is bringing, he's turning this all upside down. I'm the fulfillment of this. There's a new way about functioning with God. You're looking at him. Plus, right? they've never heard this. Never heard. But they did have Elijah's story. Well, they did, but it infuriated them because he's saying, well, let me just keep reading. So so you go back to verse 26. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath. So we read that in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And that's Second Kings 5. We have another Gentile. <laughs> from and, Syria. And, They're both from Syria. Well, and guess this. He's, this guy's rich, which makes this worse. Because you think, now wait a minute here. Didn't this all start off with saying, I came to preach good news to the poor? Well, he... The fact that he picked a poor woman because of a famine, but he picked a rich guy. This, this guy was loaded. He was the that, general over the whole Syrian army. But, but when you read that story, I think we could read the condensed version of it. Yeah, I can tell the story. So, so he, so he's in he the he's up in Syria. 
and he's got leprosy. And some, the king in Syria says, well, have you considered maybe going down to the prophet in Israel? Which is pretty amazing. <laughs> he says, you know, I've heard big things about him, which is kind of interesting in the context of what happens here. So, so Naaman leaves Syria, comes all the way down to Israel, has all this entourage, and he's got money. And he, he's like, he comes up to the house, and, and Eli, Elisha just sends a servant out and tells him what to do, and it offends him. Yeah, because he wouldn't. Because he's like, I mean, I'm, I'm the, you know, powerful general. I came all this way, and you got this servant that comes out and tells me to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. So he's like, kind of furious about it. But then one of his servants says, "Well, if he had asked you to do something great, which, wouldn't you have done? Wouldn't it? you have done it? Mm-hmm. All he's saying is just go down here to this river." And so then he does. And of course, he well, he, yeah, he he kind of kicked and screamed a little bit, right? But he did it, and he's healed. Then he's overwhelmed because, I mean, if you have leprosy, which there was no cure, I mean, he so he wants to now go give him a reward. Right. And I think this is the fascinating uh, part of the story, you know, just for bonus stuff. So he goes back and tries to pay him. And Elisha is like, no, nah, I don't want your money. You know, just go praise God and. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't do this for money. So one of uh, Elisha's Gehazi. servant, yeah, Gehazi, he <laughs> sees opportunity here. So he leaves, and while Naaman is on the road, he's like, hey. He follows him down the road. Oh, Elisha changed his mind <laughs> about, uh. that, about that prize, the uh, reward. So, so and I mean, here's Naaman. He's got all this wealth. He's like, dude, sure. I don't have leprosy, you know. Take Hold you out want. your hands, you know. Here, here you go. And so, what I think is really cool about the story is it's bad for Gehazi. <laughs> so, since he did that, well, then the Lord who healed Naaman's leprosy gave that same le- leprosy to Gehazi. <laughs> That's right. All of a sudden, as he's carrying his silver, I heard, gold, I heard, I heard a guy preach a sermon on this one time, Jason. When when he comes back to Elijah, Elijah says, "Where have you been?" And the Hebrew phrase, his reply was, nowhere in particular. <laughs> Which I thought, how many times have you been told that by your teenage child, right? Nowhere in particular. And the guy preaches the sermon and says, when, a, when someone tells you they've been nowhere in particular, that means they've been somewhere in general. <laughs> and well, exactly. up to no I feel good. the same way when, somebody, when you ask somebody where they're from and they're like all over. Yeah. Parts you know what that enough. tells me? You got... Some things in your past that you're ashamed of. You need Jesus immediately. If you can't just, because you don't want me looking up what happened in your hometown. <laughs> so why do they all get furious about this? So so here's the application. Because I believe, and, and Al, you can chime in. I, what, what I believe happened is when he said, he challenged their hearts that they weren't poor in spirit. This was about sin and hearts and being uh, being blind to to what God has done through him, to being hardened in a prison and not realizing it, that this was God's plan. And so he picked two people who were Gentiles, which I do think that he was laying down a foundation too, that God is for everybody. It's bigger. Here. I mean, that, that's a that's a overwhelming point that comes out of this yep. if you have a a heart that's broken you know uh if you're poor in spirit which which reminds me of that preach the good news to the poor if you realize that you're you're in a prison from your own sin and ways and trying to do this by yourself and you think you're you're great and don't see a need for god it was it was a great news jesus told them Great it was, news. and they got furious. But it was just over their head at the time. They just said, they wanted to kill him. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm talking about, have you ever preached a sermon where they wanted to kill you? I don't know. I've Is heard he... a few that you never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think you're right, Jace, and I like the reference. I think one of the reasons why the other Gospels don't mention this setting, but Luke does, is because Luke, being a Gentile, being an outsider initially, so he he saw that little thing you were talking about, Jay, about because that's the other side of this. 
It's not just their sin that made them so furious and their realization, but it's also that Jesus, who was saying, I'm from here, but I'm really an outsider to bring you to salvation. And he uses an illustration of what outsiders can do. So I think it's a double thing he's working here. Yep. Jesus well, Jesus yeah. was from Nazareth, but I, he was also the son of God that came here from the heavenly realms. And the, that's obviously true. that's what they were having a hard time. I think that's one thing. But I think also another thing that's very important is he picked two people that he was saying, it doesn't matter where, where your border is or where you're from. You better have a heart for God mm-hmm. that will surrender. It when it because it was very hard for Naaman. You know, it's it's really hard for a man of power to submit to anything, and to go down there and to finally say, "Well, you know, I'll try it." Because we would think, "Well, he had leprosy," but you know, it's just hard. Yeah. And the guy didn't even come out and see. Him. All he had to do was go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. He's good to go, and he had a problem with that. Well, you know, it's hard for powerful people with, right. with wealth to listen to anyone. It is, and he even complained about the river. He said, "Why do I want to get in that mud hole? I passed two really beautiful rivers. You want me to come across two rivers here. to get to this one? <laughs> That's right." But he did it. Yep. And this woman who was in these very humble circumstances who had every reason in the world to be mad at the world and mad at God, and she did it. Yep. She went along with this as crazy as it was. And so that's why I think in both cases, he was showing you a, a heart that's open to listening to God. And this is crazy. I know this is crazy, but I'm from here, and I am the Son of God. As crazy as this sounds, that's right. watch me. You know, or like what happened with uh, Nathaniel and Philip when he said, come and see. You know, Trust me, I'm telling you the truth. That's why and, I once said to somebody, it would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus. Yeah, no, I agree. But this this is proof of it. So, and Jay's about this woman. I think the the reason her son died and then Elijah resurrected him was to show her that if you trust in me, anything is possible. In other words, if she doesn't make the first cake, then her son was going to die anyway a little while later, but there would have been no bringing him back yep. had but, the prophet but look, in there. Jesus knew they were familiar with these two stories. The reason we had to read it is because most of our listeners are not familiar with these two stories. But these two stories, if true, and I believe they are, are very exciting if you're a human being. <laughs> <That's right>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They, bo- they both involve people being healed from diseases that have no cures and people coming back from the dead yep. and the Lord providing. I mean, this is awesome. You and, call that in the world game, set, match. That's right. Exactly. And Jesus is using two awesome stories to uh, telling religious people that I am the fulfillment of that. And look, here's what we're getting out of this. We're getting... Good news. We're, but it's not the, it's not what they're thinking because I believe they were putting this in the physical sense. They Agreed. thought, well, when are you going to crush Rome? Well, you better, you better get on verse thirty. You better do it pretty quick because you're running out of time. So what was what was the final word on so that? So what happened when they? So in Bert, they get to the cliff because we had a ready literal, to throw them off. We had a literal cliffhanger. <laughs> we did. And God does what the evil one tried to get Jesus to do earlier. Somehow, whether it was angels. And you remember, after the evil one left, or Jesus left the temptation, you remember what happened? And this is in one of the other Gospels. Angels came and attended. attended to the very thing the evil one was trying to get him to do happened. But it happened on God's terms, not, not, on, not yep. from selfish ambition. And here the same thing happened. They were fixed to throw him off the cliff. And verse 30 says, But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now it burns religious people up to not know more details. (laughs) But somehow God protected him. That's right. And maybe just in confidence he walked right through them and said, You won't touch me. Which the whole point is if you trust in the Lord... You're in good hands. All things are possible. I love it. it. All right, we're out of time. We'll uh, we'll flesh it out just a bit more in overtime if you want to follow us over at blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, 
Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.